Well, let's uh, receive Dr. Segi Gavinder as he comes to share with us for the last time. Bless you. Well, very good morning. And thank you, Tamu Mirolan, for this wonderful privilege. My immense gratitude for Tamu over the years. I've been a beneficiary of the great grace upon his life. Uh, when I met Tamu many years ago, there was a quantum leap in our ministry, even in our churches. And I want to really thank Tamu and Mirolan for the impact they've had upon us and our ministry and upon the lives of all our sons. Uh, I know you have heard that this is the last school, but knowing Tamu is going to invent something even greater than this. <laughs> So don't think, don't think that Bible studies are off. We are, there's still greater things to come. Well, this, this morning, uh, I want to get straight into it and talk to you about uh, the benefits of Zion. Uh, the one benefit that I did not deal with is the deliverance from poverty. Now, Zion, as you know, is a spiritual position. And Obadiah 117 says, upon Mount Zion, there will be deliverance. Here, believers will be delivered from poverty. The Bible says in Proverbs 10, 15, the rich man's wealth is his strong city. The destruction of the poor is the poverty. We know that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And I want you to know that poverty is a demonic manifestation. You need money to come to church. You need money to buy CDs and MP3s. You need money to buy a car and a house. You need money to disciple nations. You need money for food, clothing, and medicines. You need money for good works. You need money for holidays. You need money to be available for kingdom activity. You need money to take off from work. You need money to buy a fishing license. <laughs> you need money for toll fees. You need money to pay your water and lights. You need money for your TV license. The list goes on. So, no wonder Ecclesiastes 10.19 says, money answers all things. A poor man's wisdom is despised. Folk laugh when a rich man cracks a joke, even if it is not funny. <laughs> a rich man can say anything. A rich pastor can say anything and get away. A rich pastor can say that the reason you're poor is because you are eating pork, and no one will challenge it. In fact, everyone may just clap their hands. A rich man can get citizenship in any country, a rich man can get to the front of the queue without any objections. A rich man can eat with the president. A rich man has access to the best medical care and legal services. A rich man can open doors and has influential contacts. A rich man can solve more problems than a poor man. A rich man gets a better bond rate at the bank than a poor man. A rich man gets a better discount. A rich man can afford better education. A rich man has rich friends. A rich man eats better food. A rich man can have his own gymnasium and personal trainer. So you know there are so many benefits of being rich. No wonder people are bound by covetousness. Now, money is not evil. Being rich is not a sin. It's the love of money that is the root of all evil. I want to quickly do cover some, some ground on what I did at the last ALS because you need to hear this before I get to my main message today. In Genesis 12, verses 2 onwards, the promise to Abraham, I'll make you a great nation, I will bless you, make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless them that bless you and curse him that curses you and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Now the Jew was wealthy because of the promise to Abraham. 
the Jew makes about makes up about one percent of the world's population. 176 Nobel Prize winners are Jews. They are the most successful and the most persecuted. They own a vast amount of real estate and successful companies, the likes of which are the Oppenheimers, Mark Zuckerberg, Steven Spielberg, Albert Einstein, and uh, you know this in Genesis chapter 17, verse 7, God says, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your seed after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your seed after you. And I'll give to you and to the seed after you the land wherein you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan. The Jew was promised Israel. The Jew is still blessed materially today. Mark Zuckerberg is the sixth richest person in the world and the richest Jew after accumulating more wealth than anyone else in the past year according to the 2016 uh, st statistics. 11 of the 50 richest people in the world are Jewish according to the 30th annual Forbes billionaire list. The list features five Jews in the top 15 and 17 in the top 25 spots. Zuckerberg added 11.2 billion to his net wealth last year, bringing his total fortune to 44.6 billion dollars and moving him up to number six on the list. Uh, Oracle CEO Larry Ellison uh, is runner-up and, uh, and Ellison is the seventh on the list with a net worth of 43.6 billion dollars followed by Bloomberg with $40 billion. And you could ref refer to Forbes billionaire list to see this, and you'll notice that not one of them are pastors on the list. <laughs> so the blessings are promised to the Jews, and you can see that in life that the Jews are very, very wealthy. The blessings are also promised to the church. Vatican City has a richest economy relative to its size, uh, the CIA estimates that the Vatican City's 2011 revenue to be about $308 million. It has a population of 800 people, meaning its GDP is, per capita is $365,796, making it the richest state on the planet Earth. The Catholic Church is the biggest financial power wealth accumulator and property owner. She is a great, greater possessor of material riches than any other single institution, corporation, bank, giant, uh, trust, government, or state of the whole globe. I'm quoting this from an internet article. The Pope is a visible ruler of this immense amassment of wealth and is consequently the richest individual of the 20th century. So the Catholic Church is very rich. The Catholic Church cannot say, like Peter, silver and gold are by none. <laughs> but as you know, they cannot say to the lame man, take up your bed, or, or say to the lame man, walk. But I want you to know that the true church is going to be more blessed, more blessed financially. In Romans 4, verse 13, for the promise that he should be heir of the world, listen to this, not heir of Canaan, but heir of the world, was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. So notice that, that we should be heir of the world. For if they which of the law be heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. Because the law works wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Now, biblical prosperity is fourfold. It is physical or biological. It is psychological. It is social. And it is spiritual. Now, when we talk about physical health and wealth, 
You'll notice that Abraham was very wealthy. Isaac was very wealthy. You know that Isaac sowed and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. Jacob was wealthy. Jesus was also very wealthy. Uh, he received gold, mere frankincense. And you know that there were not three wise men that came to him. There were many that came to him. And they brought gold. And, and so I believe they lived off that gold. His parents lived off that gold. Jesus was very wealthy. He, he rode on a brand new donkey. <laughs> he slept in a brand new tomb. And there were people who were uh, gambling for his outfit, his seamless outfit. In fact, he was so wealthy, he had 12 full-time staff. <laughs> Many pastors don't even have anyone, any staff members. <laughs> And uh, many pastors just have a desk and a phone, and uh, they keep sending messages to people, please call me. <laughs> but, but Jesus was very wealthy. Jesus was very wealthy. Uh, he was so wealthy that no one noticed that money was missing from the treasury. No one noticed that Judas was a thief because there was so much. And when Judas stole, no one just... No one noticed except Jesus. And so, uh, it's not just physical or, bi uh, or just material wealth. When we talk about biblical prosperity, the Hebrews call it shalom. It's biological, psychological, social, and spiritual. And when we talk about social well-being, it means having the favor of men, having influential friends. Most pastors do not have influential friends especially if you're from the Pentecostal background, because you've spent all your life Monday to Sunday in the church, and you have no time to develop a relationship outside of the church. Uh, Paul knew Lydia, the seller of purple, whose customers were kings. Philip connected to the Ethiopian eunuch who handled the treasury of Candace the queen. Uh, Elisha was so well connected to the king that he asked the Shunammite woman, do you want me to put a word for you with the king? So I want you to know that, that social welfare, social well-being is having contacts. There's nothing wrong with having contacts. It's not carnal. It's knowing people in, the, in high places. And uh, this is an area that has to be developed in the church. Because a lot of folk in the church, they have no influence at all. They only know someone that knows someone that knows someone. <laughs> but they, they, don't, they have absolutely no contacts and therefore very little influence. Spiritual well-being is having the favor of God. Mental well-being is having a healthy mind, emotion, and will. This is a prosperity of the soul. Things that Dr. Sam was referring to. We have a, a, a saying in Phoenix that the neurotic is one who builds castles in the air. The psychotic is one who lives in those castles. <laughs> the charismaniac is the one that charges rent. <laughs> and the fool is the one that pays the rent. <laughs> so what did you know that prosperity is in the will of God. And these scriptures were alluded to, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, just as your soul prospers. In Jeremiah 29, 11, God says, For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. There are some places where I can't quote that scripture. After the meeting, I'll be rebuked by those pastors because it says out of context that that was for the people in Babylonian captivity. I want you to know the scriptures are not only historical, they are also prophetic. And they prophesy to us who are refugees from Babylon. We are a people that have exited systems, church systems that are against the purposes of God. And uh, God wants to prosper you. And it's very important in this last school that you go out with a message from my side that you must prosper. And you must prosper 
materially. That means you must have money if you're going to go to the nations. You must have money if you're going to have conferences. There's some places that you will go, you have to pay for everything. And if you're going to have credibility, you must have money. No one respects a pastor that's driving a car that breaks down everywhere. I'm telling you the truth. Believe me, I come from a place where there are 2,000 churches. I have not studied in a Bible school. My study is I study people. I study people. I spend a lot of time studying people. I learn not from my mistakes. I learn from other people's mistakes. <laughs> it's very important that you do that. And I know God is not interested in your bank balance, but people are interested. And it's very important, as I speak to you today, in this last school, that you become a wealthy pastor, a wealthy, a wealthy leader. No one's going to listen to you if you're not wealthy. You can have the best revelation, they're not going to listen to you. So God's going to change that, and he's going to raise up a people from Zion, a people who have come up to this mountain, and is going to transfer the wealth of the wicked into our hands. And I know we have quoted that many times. The Bible says that I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Genesis 12, 2 says, I'll make you a great nation. I will bless you. Make your name great and you shall be a blessing. God wants to bless you. The fundamental purpose of the blessing is for you to be a blessing to others. I have known Tamu now for several years, and I know that he is a blessing to others. I know that I know him to be one of the greatest givers I have ever seen. I've walked with him closely, and so I've seen our people persecute him, our people attack him, and I know that that. One of the reasons why he has experienced the elevation of grace is because is he carries with him a very generous spirit. In James chapter 4, in verse number 3, he says, You ask and do not receive, because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. It's very important to realize that money is also dangerous uh, because if you are living in adultery in a shack, in a jondol in the neighborhood, and uh, you receive a lot of money, you will shift your adultery from the shack to a five-star hotel. <laughs> just to consume it upon your lusts. That's what James is talking about. The Bible says in Proverbs 10 verse 22, the blessings of the Lord makes one rich, and he has no sorrow with it. Prosperity comes from God. He is called El Shaddai. And he is called Jehovah Jireh. God takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. Because I meet a lot of pastors that hate the mention of the word prosperity. They will not come to your meeting if they know you are a prosperity teacher. But let's get the balance right. Everyone wants to be prosperous. You must be mentally ill if you don't want to become prosperous. <laughs> the reason why so many people go to the casino is because they want to prosper. In fact, the reason so many people get up on Monday and go and do jobs that they do not like is because they want to be prosperous. And how do I know that people are going Monday to do jobs that they don't, they don't like it's because on Monday, all doctor's surgeries are full. <laughs> because people are sick and tired of their jobs, but they'll still go because they want to prosper. And I want you to know that God takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. It is scriptural to pray for prosperity. Psalms 118 verse 25. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now Prosperity. The purpose of prosperity, 2 Corinthians 9, 8, for God is able to make all grace abound to you, that in all things at all times, you may have all that you need to abound in every good work. I want you to know that in this apostolic season, I desire that everyone that has come into this season 
and come into the revelation of this word that they prosper. That they prosper more than they did under the Pentecostal movement or under the charismatic movement. This is for our credibility. For our credibility. Now the prosperity of the church is encrypted in symbols and therefore a lot of people have difficulty in understanding it. They think it's for Old Testament Israel. But I urge you to go and study both Zechariah Zach uh, chapter 8 and uh, let me read to you some of the, the, the verses that refer to prosperity. Uh, Zechariah chapter 8 verse 1, again the word of the Lord of hosts came saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am zealous for Zion with a, with a great zeal, with great fervor I am zealous for her. Thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion and dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth, the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Thus says the Lord of hosts, old men and old women shall sit again in the streets of Jerusalem, each one with his staff in his hand because of great age. The streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in its streets. This is talking about the prosperity of Zion. Notice there will be old men and old women sitting in the streets of Jerusalem, and there'll be boys and girls playing in the streets. Today there are no boys and girls playing on the streets because we have drug addicts, drug merchants on our streets, we have criminals on our streets, but this is all, Zechariah 8 talks about the prosperity of, of Zion, and in verse number 12 it says, For the seed shall be prosperous, the vine shall give its fruit, the ground shall give an increase and the heavens shall give the dew. I will cause the remnant of this people to possess all these. And I urge you to go and study the whole of Zechariah chapter 8 and see how it applies to us. And how the, the reversal of the curse takes place in Zion verse 13 onwards. I will save you and you shall be a blessing. Another portion of scripture to refer to that speaks about the prosperity of the church is Joel chapter 2 verse 18 to 19 and most people only refer to Joel when they talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit but Joel chapter 2 also talks about the prosperity of the church and it says in verse 18 the Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people the Lord will answer and say to his people behold I'll send you grain and new wine and oil and you will be satisfied by them and all of this is in the context of Zion. And we know that grain, wine, and oil are all symbols of the Holy Spirit. But they're also symbols of prosperity just as rain, former and latter rain, besides being a symbol of the Holy, Holy Spirit, is also a symbol of prosperity. And we look at verse 25. It says, so I'll restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust, my great army, which I send amongst you. And I invite you to go and explore the principles of prosperity in Joel chapter 2, Zechariah chapter 9, and uh, Zechariah chapter 8, and now also in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 23. You can read the whole of Isaiah chapter 30. Then shall he give, uh, verse 23, then shall he give the rain of thy seed, a reading from the old King James Version, and thou shalt sow the ground, and the bread of the increase of the earth, and that shall be fat and plenteous. In that day shall your cattle feed in large pastures. The oxen likewise and the young asses that ear the ground shall eat clean provender, which has been winnowed with the shovel and with the fan, and there shall be upon every high mountain and upon every high hill rivers and streams of water in the day of the great slaughter when the towers fall. All of this refers to the prosperity of Zion, and there are three prophets talking about this, and you know a threefold cord is not easily broken. Now, I quickly want to read to you Isaiah chapter 65, which also speaks about the prosperity of Zion. Verse 17 says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered, nor come into mind. So when we talk about new heavens and new earth, there's one school of thought that God would create a brand new earth and a brand new heaven. That's one school of thought. But another school of thought which I believe is that that new heaven and new earth is actually Zion, is Jerusalem, 
because verse 18 has to be read together with verse 17. But be glad and rejoice forever in which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and a people a joy. So God is saying, I create a new, new heavens and a new earth. And then he tells us exactly what he's creating. He's creating Jerusalem. This is a new Jerusalem. This is a descending city. This is, this is Zion. The new Jerusalem, as you know, the length is equal to the breadth, is equal to the height, and is a replica, or rather is a manifestation of the most holy place that housed the Ark of the Covenant. And here in verse 19, God says, And I'll rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. This will be a city of great joy. Uh, uh, and this is something that money can't buy. And yet God affirms his ownership of the people. This is a location where God seizes ownership of the people. And he calls Jerusalem my people. And he says in verse 20 of chapter 65, Know that Zion is the place of perfection. It is one step before glorification. And, uh, and there shall, in verse 20 says, There shall by be no, uh, no more than an infant of days, nor an old man that has not filled his days. For the child shall die a hundred years old. But the sinner being hundred years old shall be accursed. The minimum age in Zion is hundred years. Hundred years. And here we'll have fulfillment of our dreams and our vision. The Bible says they shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. And the Bible talks about this blessed company Verse 23, they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord and the offspring with them. And God will be zealous to answer the prayers of his people. It says, it shall come to pass, verse 24, before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. All of this refers to the prosperity of Zion. And it says, the wolf and the lamb shall feed together. And the lion shall eat straw like the bullock. And the dust shall be the serpent's meat. Uh, this, is a, this is a transformation of the enemy. As you know, the, uh, what this metaphorically means is the nature of the wicked will be changed. They shall dwell together with the lamb. And we saw uh, early on in the book of Acts, the nature of wicked men changed as Saul became Paul. And those, the Bible promises that those of the synagogue of Satan will be transformed and they will come and worship before us. And the Bible says they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, saith the Lord. That means persecution will come to an end. Now, just want to refer to one very important uh, promise uh, to, to Zion, and it's in Zechariah 8.23. It says, this is what the Lord Almighty says. In those days, ten people from all languages and nations will take fair hold of one Jew by the hem of his robe and say, let us go with you. Because we have heard that God is with you. Now the ethnologue catalog of world languages uh, says that currently there are 6,909 living languages. And the Bible says that 10 people from all languages and nations will take hold of one Jew. And of course that Jew is a true Jew. That Jew is the one that is circumcised in the heart. And if you get the calculation, do the calculation, it says 10 out of every language, that means 10 out of 6,909 nations, languages, multiply that by 10, that means 69,090 people will connect to one true Jew. I hope you're seeing the implications of this. This is going to be the greatest church growth that you've ever seen. So I want you to know in terms of the glory of the latter house being greater than the glory of the former house, I want you to know there's a time coming where we're going to see great multitudes flowing into the house of God effortlessly. And that is a promise we cling to and we know that that is going to happen. Now I want to go, I want to move you back to 2 Samuel chapter 6 for the next 35 minutes or so and we're going to look at Look at the things that happen in Zion in terms of prosperity. And it says in 2 Samuel chapter 6, and we know that Zion, or oh, as I used a symbol, I used uh, the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant, 
by synecdoche, which is a part referring to the whole, or the whole referring to the part. The Ark of the Covenant refers to the most holy place, which is the New Jerusalem. And the Ark of the Covenant is also a picture of a mentality of dominion. So just keep that in your mind. And the Bible tells us in 2 Samuel chapter 6, again David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000, and 30 again, a number that refers to maturity. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baal of Judah to bring from there the Ark of the, Co Ark of the Covenant, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwells between the cherubims. And they set the Ark of God upon a new cart, brought it out of the house of Abinadab. And, uh, and Uzzah and I, the sons of Abinadab, drove the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was at Gibeah, accompanying the ark of God and I.O. went before the ark and David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fair wood even on harps and on psalteries and on timbrels and on cornets and on cymbals and when they came to Nacon's threshing floor Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it for the oxen shook it and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah and God smote him there and they died by the ark of God. And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah. And he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How shall the ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not remove the ark of the Lord to him into the city of David. But David carried it aside into the house of Obed Eden the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed Eden the Gittite. For three months and the Lord blessed Obed Edom and all his household and it was told David saying the Lord has blessed the house of Obed Edom and all that pertains to him because of the ark of God so David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed Edom into the city of David Zion with gladness now notice wherever the ark went it wreaked havoc in the enemy's camp you know that River Jordan parted in two. The walls of Jericho were flattened. And when the ark went into the territory of the Philistines, it brought boils or hemorrhoids, whatever you, your interpretation of that may be, a plague of rats. And when the ark returned to a place called Beth Shemesh, thousands of people died because they lifted up the mercy seat to look into the ark of the covenant. And so you see that there was a carnage everywhere the ark went. And the ark came to rest in the house of Abinadab. And so David, his great passion was to bring the ark to Zion. And the Bible tells us that he went with a great company of men, uh, chosen men, fetched the ark. They came to the threshing floor of Nacon uh, amidst a great worship service, great music, etc. The Bible tells us Uzzah dies on the threshing floor. Here's another casualty now. Uzzah reaches out to touch the ark and he dies. Uh, God cannot be bribed with music. So here you have some of the best musicians worshipping, praising God. And on the threshing floor, Uzzah dies. And David is petrified. And he became, the Bible says he was afraid of the Lord that day. But deep in his heart he wanted the ark to come to him and he did not know how to do it. So what David did, he took the ark and placed it in the house of Obed Edom, the Gittite. Now, the word Obed, Obed means the servant who serves God the right way. The servant who serves God the right way. And the word Edom means, or it means red, but it also means one who causes others to blush. It's a definition from the Jewish encyclopedia. After the death of Uzzah, David was, a, was afraid to receive the ark. So he took the ark into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. There is no evidence in scripture that Obed-Edom protested. His bravery could have caused David to blush with shame. He served David by putting his own life in danger. 
He took a risk that even David could not take. David could handle Goliath, but not the ark. David was scared. Obed-Edom was brave. But look at Obed-Edom. There is no reference to an Obed-Edom said. He did not protest. He could have said, Lord, he could have come to David and said, David, what about an insurance policy for my family? <laughs> you know, my wife likes to clean the house. What if she accidentally touches the ark with a broom? My kids love to play in my house. What if they accidentally kick the ark? So can't we have some kind of insurance policy here? No such thing. He was an excellent servant. He was not an adadiza. Adadiza means noisy helper. He knew how to help in silence. I could imagine why David would do such a thing. David said, listen, this is what the Ark of the Covenant did in Philistine territory. And uh, Obed-Edom comes from a place, is a Gittite. Probably a relative of Goliath. Let me take the ark and leave it in his house. And let's check what happens to this guy. <laughs> so basically David is experimenting because David does not know the scriptures yet. But you must understand this. That when it comes to understanding Obed-Edom is very confusing. You really have to go into great depth because there are four Obed-Edoms. Some people think that this Obed-Edom was a Philistine from Gath. But the reality is, he is called a Gittite because he was an inhabitant of gath Rimen, which was a Levitical city in the tribe of Dan allocated to the Coats. So really, this guy was not a Philistine, but he came from gath Rimen, And he was a Kohath. And you know, from the tribe of Levi, you had Kohath, Geshon, and Merari, which were clans. And from them, you get Korah. So he, a descendant of Korah. And the Korahites were gatekeepers. And the Bible tells us that Obed-Edom Obed and his family were Gatekeepers, his sons were gatekeepers. And gatekeeping was a task assigned to Korah and his descendants. The, the gatekeeper, in, your, in some of our Bibles, it would be porter. He was a porter. Kohats were responsible for carrying the, 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 furnish, the furnishings of the tabernacle. And so, uh, this guy, this person, Obed-Edom, was actually a Kohath who was qualified to carry the ark, so he was at the right place and at the right time. Now, there are other Obed-Edoms. There's the son of Jeduthun, who was uh, Obed-Edom here, was also a porter, and he came from the clan of Merari. And there's another Obed-Edom uh, who served during the time of King Amaziah. But the important thing here is that this Obed-Edom took the Ark of the Covenant into his house and the Bible tells us something happened in his house. The Bible tells us uh, this didn't happen anywhere else but in, in, our, in his house, the Bible says Hobart Edom was blessed. There was a threefold blessing. The Bible says Obed Edom was blessed. His household was blessed and all that pertained to Hobart Edom was blessed. The Bible does not go into great extent to tell us who all the different Obed-Edoms are because uh, I believe there's, there's, some, there's a reason for that. That means if you live 1,000 kilometers away and you named your son Obed-Edom because the name pertained to Obed-Edom, your Obed-Edom would be blessed. <laughs> uh, choosing names are very important. I can't understand how parents choose names for their children like Jezebel. 
Judas, Ichabod, Benoni, Obadiah is a great name. And the Bible says, God blessed Obadiah. Blessed Obadiah, blessed his household, and blessed all that pertained to him. A threefold blessing. So if you went to Obadiah's house, everything in his jurisdiction was blessed, and it was blessed because the Ark of the Covenant was there. Now, that means Obadiah's wife was blessed, his dog was blessed. How do you know his dog was blessed? His dog was chasing the cat. <laughs> it's not the other way, the cat chasing the dog. Everything was in order. If he, had a, if he had a vegetable patch, that vegetable patch was blessed. His fruit trees were blessed. Everything in his jurisdiction was blessed. I submit to you, if you take the Ark of the Covenant into your house, this apostolic message, this principle of dominion that you are hearing about, and all the things that you've been hearing about in the school in the last 30 years, I submit to you that you will reap the same blessings. And I want to give you a prophetic word today. The Bible says within three months, within three months, Obed Edom was blessed. Now, in Joel chapter 2, it says, The threshing floors shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with new wine and oil. So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, the chewing locust, my great army which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be put to shame. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. How was Israel to know that God was in a midst by a prosperity? Prosperity has become a swear word. But what you despise, you will not receive. What you despise, it will never come to you. But if you say, Lord, I want prosperity. Lord is going to increase my credibility. You're going to go back to your own churches. Some of us have small churches. Some of us have no influence. But let me say to you, like Obadiah, no one knew about him. But when he decided to take this mentality, take this ark into his house, take it as a servant. The Bible says, Obed means one who serves God the right way. And when you begin to practice the principles of righteousness and all that you have heard, I say to you that within three months, within three months, it can happen to you. It can happen to you. Three is a very powerful number, as Randolph gave us some uh, meanings of three. You know, there's a bud, flower, and fruit. There are three feasts to complete. There are three days in the fish's belly before being delivered. There are three floors to complete the ark. Elijah laid three times on the child to complete the resuscitation. In John chapter 17, Jesus prayed three times for oneness. Three times Jesus asked Peter if he loved him for completeness. Jesus died at three o'clock and declared it is finished. Three hours of darkness from midday to three o'clock before it is finished. Three courts to complete the tabernacle. Now today is the 15th day of the ninth month. 15 is three times five. Nine is three times three. Come on now, this is not accidental. This is not accidental. 
you can go out despising this you can go out calling this childish but you can say lord i believe something can happen in my life lord i've been faithful lord i want breakthrough lord i want to prosper i tell you i come from a very poor family i've shared this often before we were so poor that poor people called us poor you know how poor that is <laughs> we never i never knew that i was poor until i went to university and met rich people and when i qualified as a medical doctor my first stipend was 200 rand a month second year as a medical practitioner in hospital i earned 700 rand a month and when i went to buy a car the car dealer chased me from his office i know what it is to be poor when i went to the bank when we we're going to build our second floor in the when we want to build our church i went to the bank i took my elders we took our collateral we went to the bank and uh, the bank manager looked at all our collateral first he made us wait outside he never invited us into his office he spoke to us in the corridor and asked us to leave <laughs> and i tell you within 3 days the judgment of god fell on that bank and god removed that bank manager although we never complained and we went to another bank we asked the bank sir said to said to us send us all your collateral we sent all our collateral and the bank refused to even give us an appointment and 3 days later that entire network of banks closed down a few weeks later the lord gave us all the money we needed to build our church and i wanted to know i wanted to know today i know what it is like to be poor and i don't like pastors who criticize prosperity people hated nehemiah because a rumor was going out that there was a man that had come into the city that wanted that sought the prosperity of god's people you have come to all these schools it is very important that you prosper it is very important that you have money in your pockets money in your bank account money all over because if you want to serve god effectively you have to be well resourced we take of take take care of pastors every week there are pastors coming from other countries they come visit us to see our model and we have to provide accommodation we provide meals we provide free transportation and when they go back we give them an offering although they did not preach now for you to do that you have to be prosperous I believe there's a Joseph company rising up will give you grain as Tamu used to mention and put silver in your bags. We must be prosperous. When you are prosperous, people believe your message. People respect you. I've been to many churches. I don't travel as much as Tamu. Now I'm I retired from medicine when I was 45 years. And now I'm 55 years. and i'm taking things easy now in the church <laughs> but i want god's people particularly those who are preaching this reformation to be the most prosperous people on the earth that it will provoke others to run into this city and say show us your ways people don't go to a poor man's house and faint <laughs> the queen of sheba came to solomon's house and she fainted there <laughs> i want to see some people faint how about you <laughs> i want to see some people faint i tell you when people see me today i no longer bear any resemblance to my biological father No one can trace him back to trace me back to my biological father. 
I have changed so much. Because I want to be more and more like my heavenly father. Amen. Amen. And you have to be more and more like your heavenly father. And one of my greatest desires is to see God's people prosper. And I've seen that. I've seen the poorest of the poor come into the house of God. And I've seen how they prosper. I've seen people come into the house of God prosper. And they don't know how to handle wealth. I remember I had an elder many years ago. He was poor. And then he began to practice our principles and he became wealthy. He used to pick up people for me, bring them to the church. So one day he came to me and said, I'm sorry, Pastor, I won't be able to pick up people anymore. As you know, I just bought a brand new Mercedes Benz. I don't want these filthy people sitting on my back seat. <laughs> we were so heartbroken. We were so heartbroken. And then he packed up and he left our church. So if you don't know how to handle money, you're not going to climb this mountain. Your hands have to be clean. And you must not be lustful. Some of you, you here, you better get ready after you leave the school. You will be fathering some of the sheikhs that come from Saudi Arabia. Amen. Believe it. Believe it. If God can visit Cornelius and tell him, go and call Peter, he'll tell you what you must do. That's going to happen Right now, because the Islamic world is imploding. There are a large number of Muslims who are now, con who are now uh, challenging their faith. When they see these murders taking place, they're causing them to look elsewhere. And a large number are coming to Christ. So it's going to be a time where sheikhs from the Islamic world are going to come. And they, these are people that have a God-searching mentality. They're going to come and say, show us your ways. And you've got to be ready to father them. You have been prepared in the school. You have been prepared in the school. You must have sufficient information, sufficient anointing, sufficient grace to handle what's going to come with them. And I submit to you that if you are willing to receive it, and if you have taken the Ark of the Covenant into your house, I prophesy to you that within three months, within three months, you will be blessed. You will be blessed. Every one of you that's in the school, everyone that's listening by live streaming, today is the 15th of the ninth month. I say to you, by the 15th of December, within that period, within that three-month period, you're going to be so blessed that the 16th of December is going to be declared a public holiday. You better get ready to be blessed. The blessings, the blessings of the apostolic season are greater than the charismatic season. When the charismatic see the way the apostolic season is blessed, and how many of you know they love money? They're going to come into this. We're looking at thousands and thousands of people rushing in, pressing in, I want you to know in Luke chapter 1 verse 35, angel answered and said to the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. You therefore also that only one who is to be born will be called the son of God. Now indeed Elizabeth your relative has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God nothing will be impossible. Notice Elizabeth is six months pregnant when she meets Mary, and Mary is carrying the Ark of the Covenant. And the baby j jumps in a womb, and three months later, the delivery takes place. I want to say to you, within three months, it's going to happen for you. If it never happened before, I say to you, it has to happen to you. You know why it's going to happen to you? Because death and life are in the power of the tongue. Yes. And he who loves it will eat his fruit. Yes. You see, the reason why many people suffer trauma to the soul, as Sam, Dr. Sam was saying to us, is because of what the parents said. You see what Israel said? 
when, when they faced Jesus, they said to the, to the Sanhedrin, let his blood be upon us. And in AD 70, in AD 70, what they declared to themselves took place. And I say to you, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And I come to you today to declare your prosperity. <laughs> to declare your prosperity. All of you that have been coming faithfully to the school, I declare to you that you will prosper beyond your wildest dreams. You will prosper like Obed Edom. The Bible says you will decree a thing and it will come to pass. So I take the liberty today and say to you that it is impossible for God to lie and therefore I decree the thing. I say that you will prosper in the name of Jesus. There is a hard piece of scripture which says in Romans 4.17, God will give life to the dead and call those things which do not exist as though they did. That means God's prerogative to call things that are not as if they were. It's God's prerogative. But in the Bible, certain human beings did what God did. Elijah did it. There was no rain. He called something that was not as if it was. Elisha did it. Elisha did it. There was famine in the land, and he said, tomorrow there will be abundance. He called that which was not as if it was. He called it into existence. And I want you to know the Bible says, of those born of women, there's none greater than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom is greater than John the Baptist. That means, that means you of the kingdom are greater than John the Baptist, and John the Baptist is greater than Elijah and Elisha. Therefore... You of the kingdom are greater. And if Elijah could call things that are not as if they were, I say to you that you can also call things that are not as if they were. And therefore we called, we call the blessings of God. And here's a peculiar scripture I want to bring to you, a scripture that has caused a lot of hardship to theologians. And you can go and study it. It's Isaiah 45 verse 11. And this is what it says. Thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and His Maker, ask of me things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands. You command me. This is the only scripture where God says, you can command me. Is concerning my sons, the workmanship of my hands. And Paul says, we are his workmanship. Yes. And therefore we can command the blessings yes. which he has commanded where brothers dwell together in unity. Yes. And therefore we say, Lord, we command the blessings. Yes. Within three months. Yes. Within three months. Yes. I'm going to put pressure on God. I'm going to knock on heaven. The Bible says, do not give him rest. Yes. Do not give him rest. Ask, seek, knock. Be shameless. Be undignified. Come on now. You have to be blessed. Otherwise, no one's going to believe you. No one's going to believe this reformation. No one's going to believe what you are saying. You have to be blessed. Obed Edom was so blessed. The Bible tells us in 1 Chronicles chapter 26, you can read it at home, verses 4 to 8. And all these are sons of Obed Edom. Then the sons of the brethren, able men with strength to work. 62. Obed Edom had 62 sons, grandsons. He was so blessed. Wow. He was so blessed. He had everything. The only thing he didn't have was a TV set. <laughs> so if you went to Obed Edom's house, they were rejoicing every day. <laughs> Bible says rejoice with the wife of your youth. I'm not going to explain that. You go home and work it out what that means. <laughs> Obed Edom was rejoicing. Some of you that are coming here for the first time, let me put it in plain terms. He was having a lot of sex. Yes. 
Oh, I offended a lot of Pentecostals. I offended a lot of Pentecostals. Well, if you're not married, within three months you're going to get a wife. He will find the wife, find the good thing. It's going to happen for you. It's going to happen for you. Tell your neighbor, thank God you came to the school. Obadidam was so blessed. So blessed. He was the arpist. He was a minister. He was a minister before the ark. He was a porter. He was a gatekeeper. He would then walk behind the ark so that no one could touch the ark. Make sure no one could touch the ark. The Bible says his sons were made in charge of the treasury. Come on now. Our sons are going to be made in charge of treasuries. The sons of this apostolic are going to be made in charge of the wealth of this world. It's going to come into your hands. Some of you are going to come into multiple millions. Multiple millions. Make sure you handle it properly. Make sure you're faithful with your tithes, your first fruits, your offerings. Make sure you know how to separate that and deal with that faithfully. Obed Edom was a blessed man. He was made in charge of the south gate. South gate was a very important gate. He stood at the south gate so that those who came via the south gate, it would make sure that those who came via the south gate did not leave via the south gate. They had to leave by another way. And this is very important in our understanding. Ezekiel 46 tells us, He shall not return by the way of the gate wherewith he came, but shall go forth over against it. That means, if you came by the south gate, you're not allowed to leave by the south gate. You have to leave through another gate. That means when you come into an Obed Edom mentality, when you enter, you must never leave the same way. Never leave. And some of you are never going to leave the same way today. When you go home, you're going to be so blessed. You're going to be so blessed. God is going to make you in charge of treasuries, wealth of this world. It's going to come into the hands of those who have come into Zion. Therefore, for you to ascend to Zion, your hands must be clean. And then the Bible tells us, Obadism was rejoicing with his family. He had sons. Everything is blessed. He's enjoying himself. And one day there's a knock on his door. Goes and checks at the door. It's David. David said, Obadism, I've come for the ark. <laughs> Obadism slams the door and said, No way! You can't take the ark! <laughs> Let me tell you, a lot of local churches have prospered, but they don't know how to release the ark. And the time has came in this reformation now. The ark has to move from a local house into the city. So the whole city, the whole city can be blessed. That's what we are after. When you go back, you're not only going to bless your church, you're going to bless the whole city. You're going to be like Samuel. The Bible says the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. That means no criminal is going to operate within your jurisdiction. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'm sorry I have to stop there. My time is up. But you go home. And be blessed. Yeah. Say to your neighbor, till 15th of November, 15th of December. 15th of December. 15th of December. Amen. Bless you.
Well, I can definitely see that some of you love money. <laughs> and this is, this is a typical charismatic anointing. <laughs> And I know that these dates resonate with uh, Randolph and Renee because their son is getting married on the 16th of December. <laughs> and Stephen Everett is getting married on the 16th of December. <laughs> Wow, and lots of, lots of, lots of SS. Okay, okay. So now we have a prophetic word to hold on to and you can feel good about it. You don't have to feel guilty. But honestly and truly, the next phase of the journey cannot be fulfilled if we do not step into the full, fullness of the promises of God. And I think at the last ALS, I opened the ALS by declaring the Feast of Tabernacles upon our Santon Conference that it's a feast of the fulfillment of all prophecies. Uh, you cannot forever live in perpetual lack because the end is the end of harvest. It's a sun teleo moment. It's a summarization of the purposes of God and, um, and the wealth of the nations and of the earth has to come back to the stewardship of the sons of God. Those, these are realities. The Bible has a very, very... Con a conclusive ending and there's no shadow of doubt in it. We, and, and some of us have to step now into that reality. My biggest challenge is the lack of discipline amongst the sons of God. They would clap their hands to a message like this but be as unfaithful to God as unfaithful can be in terms of relying on principles and fundamentals that are the foundation to to enjoying these blessings. These things don't come to an, a non-compliant or incompliant people. It comes to people who are highly principled. Highly principled. Highly principled. I, I think, if I may say this, and I don't like disclosing my heart here, but I mean, the last few months I have been tested in not having and learning how to do things as if there's an abundance in the bank accounts. I mean, our accounts have been literally bone dry. We're building a house, we're, doing, we're going into nations, we're pouring monies into things that we should not be doing. Legally speaking, we should not be doing it. Not be doing it. But we took a decision that if we do not stay principled in the midst of not having, if we first look at our own survival and then think about how to give, we will violate eternal principles, violate it. And I think it's critical that if you want these things to become a reality and to prove people like Dr. Sergi as genuine servants and prophets of God, that you don't point a finger and say, why didn't it happen when you have created holes in your own pockets? Uh, so we need to learn how to be principled. Some people think about themselves first. That's the highest form of selfish protectionism. But you have to, in this season, think about others first. I hear people talking about giving, but you know they're as stingy as stingy can be. You'll find that some people don't even know how to give a gift. Uh, people like Segi will never come to a school without bringing an offering. I mean, he sent a huge offering that helped. Uh, the budget would have been much more than the deficit I announced. These are not people that just talk. They are givers of the highest level. Uh, Rochelle will never come to visit without bringing a gift from Roland. Not that we look for these things, but these are principles that generate things. We, I would not go anywhere without taking something. Something. Uh, 
And so, so if you want to see the blessings of God overflow your banks, you don't give when you have, you give when you don't have. You give in poverty, you give in lack, you give when everything around you is saying don't give. I, you know, I'm not interested in people you know, making something then saying they're going to give you. If you can't be faithful with the little you have because you know, the first cake which the widow should have kept for herself. She gave it to the selfish man called Elijah who said, bake the first cake and give it to me. I mean, this is selfishness at the highest level. But in it was triggered a miracle that never ran dry. And so we need to bring this back, this mentality in the church. The stingy, I hate that stingy spirit. And I hear people, I see servants of God, they talk about giving, but they don't know, a cl they're clueless. One of the reasons why this move is being birthed in such a way in this country, in South Africa, at least in the streams I know of, is that the men that are doing it have laid down their lives. They have given beyond their capacity. Their churches have been emptied of their funds. Their people have been robbed to bless nations. And that's why God is now blessing. This move doesn't work by just going around with a flamboyant attitude that seems to suggest, oh, you know, we givers. That's lip talk. That's lip talk. I practice it. I go to a restaurant, I'll pay for. If, if there's 50 people, I'll pay. If I see somebody sitting on the other end of the restaurant and that's, I know them, I'll tell the waiter, that bill, no matter what it is, bring it to me. Why? Because I'm practicing how to be released from the spirit of frugality. Because when the wealth of the nations come, I will not hoard it for me and my kids and my wife. This is the spirit we have to bring back into the earth. Are you hearing the voice of the Lord here? God's breaking something in the atmosphere. And let me tell you something. Africa is going to finance the building of the tabernacle of God. <laughs> Believe me. I know that. Egypt, Egypt financed the tabernacle built in the wilderness. And Africa will finance this move of God for the advancement of his kingdom. I found that the most stingy nations in all my traveling are the prosperous nations. The nations that give the most in the season are nations that literally live from abject poverty. The worst givers are the affluent nations. So let's change that. We're going to finance the purposes of God. This continent is going to bring forth wealth that's going to be a blessing to the world. Let's we do it. And I'm speaking to us as Africans here, as those living in Africa. But I know that all of us, wherever we are, we're going to become part of this next move. And I want to be a financer. I don't want to be a getter. I've never fundraised. I've never asked a single soul for a single cent. Recently, somebody came to me and said, tell me, I'll write the check for your house. I said, I will not stoop to that level. I've never asked a man for a single thing, and I will never ask a man for a single thing. The only one I will ask, and I don't even do that, is my heavenly father. I would not ask him for money. It's seldom. I mean, I must be extremely weak to go to him and say, give me a few bucks. It's an insult for me to ask my father for material things, because I know my father knows what I need. I will not fundraise, not fundraise. I refuse to do it. I will not stoop to the indignity of doing these things. Why am I saying this? Because if you don't get your principles right, we will become schemesters using dignified forms of begging. And that church has become professionals at begging without asking. We're very good at it. Amen? Well, that's anointing is hitting me now. I don't want to talk anymore. Just have a break quick.